<clears throat> Hello, uh, uh, today is the 14th of May uh, 2023, and uh, we have the pleasure uh, to, to talk about a very important uh, Japanese architect, uh, Kunio Maekawa, born in 1905 and died, he died in 1986. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, read a little bit about him. Kunio Maekawa, uh, as you can see, born on the 14th of May, 1905. And that's the reason we talk about him today, because today it is his birthday. Was a Japanese architect and a key figure in the Japanese post-war modernism. His distinctive architectural language deftly blended together elements of traditional Japanese design and modernist tenets from Europe drawing from early career work experiences in the offices of Le Corbusier and Antonin Raymond. He's especially known for the Tokyo Bunka Kaikan uh, and the National Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo. We are going to see both buildings. His home, which he designed and completed in 1942, has been preserved and permanently installed in the Edo Tokyo Open Air Architectural Museum. And it is a beautiful house, and we are going to see it in detail as well. So you noticed already that he worked with Le Corbusier and Antonin Raymond, and we are going to see some pictures of him together with the great master. Uh, so this was uh, Kunio Maekawa, an architect very appreciated by Kenneth Frampton as well, and with good reasons. Well, Kenneth Frampton also appreciates, appreciates very, very much uh, Antonin Raymond, for whom uh, Kunio Maikawa worked. Here they are, on the left, Kunio Maikawa, on the right, Le Corbusier. What a pleasure, no, to have such a face-to-face you know, -face encounter. I don't know where they are. Is it a subway or something? No. Anyway, here they are again. Uh, with a master, uh, you know, uh, drawing something and then some Japanese uh, younger people around him. Um, Le Corbusier built in Japan the Museum of Modern Art and we are going to see the building. And later on, um, Kunio Maekawa built an annex to that work by, uh, uh, by his mentor, if we can call him, uh, Le Corbusier so, and I think we could. Again, uh, Kunio Maikaba and Le Corbusier. And here is a, an emotional picture for me with Le Corbusier visiting Japan with a group of uh, Japanese architects around him. And Kunio Maikaba is right next to him, as you can see. So um, I think it is uh, another proof, this picture and other pictures that we saw that Le Corbusier valued. Um, Kunio Maikawa. Kunio Maikawa. Now we begin with this uh, work, um, the Kimura Industrial Laboratory from 1932. So we remember he was born in 1905. So at 27, he built this in Aomori. Uh, I, I'm nostalgic a little bit because I, I did once um, a competition entry for um, a museum in Aomori. Okay, 1932, Industrial Laboratory. Unfortunately, I couldn't find uh, great pictures with this. An early work, 27 years old, uh, uh, Kunio Maikawa built, built this building. Here, there are many pictures of it, but you see the resolution is uh, unbearable, so sorry about this. I couldn't enlarge it. And here is the only you know, acceptable resolution, meaning the size of the, of the photograph that shows a fragment of the building uh, as it is, I guess, today. It, it looks like it's abandoned or something. Now, Hinamoto Hall, 1936, no pictures. And I don't have pictures for this town hall either. I couldn't find the problem with, uh, and I, I noticed this uh, in the past, uh, pictures with works by Japanese architects often are of two different kinds, either very small resolution where you can barely see anything or very large resolution, which, you know, floods, I mean, which, which uh, uh, freeze the, you 
you know, the, the, the inadequate uh, computers or laptops. And I have an old laptop and uh, I, I, I struggled with the, with the large size um, uh, pictures. And um, I also struggle with the, with the ones with a very small size, you know, or small resolution. But now we arrive at this magnificent work by him, and it's truly a beautiful house he built for himself in 1942. So he was 37 years old when he built this house for himself. It's, it's a house which is, you know, Japanese, which is, so to speak, traditional, but it's also modern. And it, it's, it's, he, he was able to, to unite the past with the present, his present, but also our present, because this is not a house that, uh, you know, looks uh, inadequate for our time. No, I wouldn't say so. I, I, I believe that uh, uh, Charles Baudelaire, the great uh, French poet uh, in the 19th century, uh, had a very astute observation about the, the two side, the two halves of art. And I include architecture here too. Baudelaire said, uh, art has two, two halves. One half is about the uh, eternal, the immutable, the, the permanent, and the other half is about the transitory, the circumstantial, the changing. So you, you have to have both. And I think this building has both. It, it has the so-called eternal, immutable, permanent side relating to the tradition of, uh, of Japan, but it also has novelty uh, relating to, you know, the circumstantial, the, you know, the modernity that uh, Maekawa was, um, you know, already immersed in. And I read that while most Japanese architects of his time looked for inspiration towards the Bauhaus, meaning towards Germany, he was looking for inspiration towards France, meaning towards Le Corbusier. A very fine house and kept very well. I also read that uh, Kunio Maikaba, as opposed to other architects, built very, um, you know, um, uh, built very well. You know, his houses are, are uh, in, in very good condition because he paid, uh, he, 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 he was very careful to build them according to the rules, so to speak. And you can see here in his own house. So this is an almost 100 years old house. And it's, it's, it's in perfect, it's in perfect shape. Uh, perfectly symmetrical, but it's not rigid. This is also a paradox because, as Bruno Sebi said, uh, modernity should avoid, by all means, symmetry. But we see here Kunio Maikawa, who was uh, one of the most important Japanese architects who brought modernity to Japan, built this house perfectly symmetrical for himself. Is it rigid? I don't think it is rigid in the sense of being, uh, you know, uh, uh, oppressively uh, symmetrical. No, it's not. It is symmetrical, but it's not. It's not rigid. A fine, a fine articulation of everything here. The small and the large, you know, and the, it, 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 it's a quintessential house. And yet, it's, it's, it's not. It's not a crashing house. It's not. It's rather small. It's 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 not a very big house with a very uh, pleasant uh, interior. Kunio Maikawa. Well, this is a section through the building, uh, probably a, you know a reproduction of an original drawing. We are going to see another one with also the 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 plans of the house. Kunio Maikawa. Why is it that the Japanese are so formidable in the field of architecture? Because they are. Of all countries in the world, they have the largest number of Pritzker Prizes. 
And even now they move the they move the world, the world of architecture. Why? Well, they work very hard, but but it's not just that. It's it's is their ability to absorb influences from other parts and that and still remain rooted in their own culture and a great uh, great sense of uh, design and uh, and measure and the love for nature and so of course not all architecture is uh, you know superlative but in some examples and it has plenty of examples japan is uh, is uh, is showing us the way. No wonder that very important uh, European or uh, North American architects love Japan, like Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, Bruno Taut, and there are others. You know, it's uh, they, they, they are an inspiration. Kunio Maekawa. But also what is perhaps a little bit strange is that actually one of the two mentors of Kunio Maikaba was a Czech architect, and that is Antonin Raymond, who lived and worked uh, in, in Japan, first as a consul of Czechoslovakia in, in Japan, and then as an architect. He was trained as an architect. And Kunio Maikaba worked in the office as Anto of Antonin Raymond and, and was influenced by Antonin Raymond. I love this house. I mean, you know, you look at this picture, it's beautiful as a photograph, but it's a photograph of a beautiful house. Now, is this the radiator here? It is, at the bottom. I mean, <laughs> You are not going to see very often something like this where the radiator is showing its face, so to speak, towards the outside. But it, it, it's, it's, it's perfectly at home with everything else. Great house and great trees. And here is the plan of the house. In a way, a very predictable plan. What is less predictable and uh, rather unexpected is this door which opens in a way which is not advisable, you know. I mean, most architects would, would open this door the other way. Interesting. Now I hope that the drawing is accurate. understood he came from a well-to-do family and uh, you know this did matter apparently he found a job with Le Corbusier uh, thanks to through the, in, the intervention of one of his uncles who worked with a diplomatic mission in in France great house bravo Kunio Maikawa Now, a bank <clears throat> from, <clears throat> from 1952, so from, 19, from 1942, when he built his own house, and to 1952, there were 10 years. But during those 10 years, a number of years were dedicated to destruction, and that is the Second World War, which was deadly for the world in general and for Japan in particular as well. So... Uh, you know, in 1952, he got this commission to build a, a bank in Tokyo, and here it is. And uh, 
you know, it, it, it kind of shows its, its age. It maybe it's not a building uh, to, uh, that, that makes it to the histories of architecture, but he built it in 1952 uh, when, when Japan was uh, making great, great, great efforts to <clears throat> emerge uh, from, the, from the ashes of the bombings in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki from losing the war and I'm sure, I mean, it was a heroic period in the life of, uh, of this great nation, uh, Japan. But, but they managed to, to come back in, 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 with great force, uh, not just in architecture, but in economy and in all fields. Kanagawa Prefectural Library and Music Hall in Yokohama from 1954. Kunio Maikawa. His architecture is um, is not is not really spectacular. It it takes some attention to to notice its quality, and uh, this is a virtue that uh, doesn't uh, you know need uh, superficial effects in order to uh, to be meaningful. So his architecture is complex. Maybe that's the reason why, as I read, he was not as advertised, I like, for example, Kenzo Tange and the Metabolis. The International House of Japan in Tokyo, he worked with another important architect, uh, Shunso Sakakura. I don't know about Shunso Yoshimura. Anyway, Japan has so many good architects, and uh, Kunio Maekawa, in this case, he worked with, the, with these two other architects from 1955. Uh, this is the, the building, the Tokyo International, the International House of Japan. As you can see, it's, it's modernity, but it's not a street and modernity. He also employed concrete, like Japan for a good number of years was uh, one of the great consumers of concrete uh, in architecture. And the uh, brutalist buildings, as they are called today, were very common in Japan. He himself, Kunio Maikawa, used concrete, but uh, later on he began to use brick, and uh, uh, so he, he kind of uh, left that uh, brutalist period uh, behind. So this is the plan of this international uh, star, uh, school. Yesterday I commented on the on the gla glass parapets of um, of uh, Tadawando in uh, Venice, uh, but here we see a glass parapet, but we also see the wooden uh, uh, handrail, and, and 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 that is a plus in my opinion. It's not just glass left by itself, but you also have the the handrail that, uh, and later on we are going to see a detail of a wooden handrail that, uh, I don't know, impressed me. Tokyo City to demolish Kunio Maekawa Design Clubhouse. This, you know, searching for material to for the presentation, I came across this uh, announcement. And this is the house, a clubhouse that uh, Tokyo decided to demolish, too bad. Um, what can we say? Too bad. Demolitions are certainly not sustainable. In general, they we should abstain from demolishing, uh, you know, uh, what we build. Okayama Prefectural Office, 1955, a fine um, office building. So different for, from. North American, uh, you know, uh, office buildings, and look here the the parapets here. You know, they are they are very sensitively done and almost with something so called traditional, and also the rhythmicity of the windows, the verticality of the windows. Yes, we have uh, horizontal bands of, of of windows, but the windows are actually vertical. I, I like this building. I don't usually fall in love with office buildings, but I think this is a good building by Kunio Maekawa.
Fukushima Education Center in Fukushima, 1956. He, look, he when when he felt like being adventurous, he was adventurous, meaning formally in the field of form. Why not? That's how the building looks like today. When was it built? 1956. So almost 70 years ago. Now, now we are going to see a, a remarkable um, housing complex, block of flats, 1959. So, you know, more than 60 years old. I truly like this, and I, I wish I had more time to study carefully, but I invite anyone who is interested in uh, Kunio Maekawa to search for this particular work, because it is a, uh, it is a work which, uh, okay, maybe you could say show some influence uh, coming from L'Unité d'Habitation by Le Corbusier, but it's, it's different, it's unique, and it's, it's, it's structurally very, very, uh, you know, uh, convincing and aesthetically equally so. So it's it's a big building. It's imposing. It's monumental, but it's 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 crafted also at the level of uh, um, you know small uh, elements uh, very well. And I would say it's very Japanese. I, I don't ask me to you know to explain. It's a feeling I have. It's it's very Japanese, although it is inspired by l'unité d'habitation. As you can see, the the Japanese are not uh, shy to you know uh, dry the carpets and uh, you know so on uh, on the balconies or even outside in front of the building. But look at the section of the building. We are going to see another image or two with, um, you'll understand better, the structure. And this kind of mega building for housing, look, this, this is a, a, you know, um, a fragment of, of the house with a, an exterior corridor from which you can access the, the apartments and look at the structure, you know, it's, it's, it's even graphically convincing and pleasing. I always like this, you know, to have exterior corridors from which you, you access the apartments because you have a cross ventilation in the apartment and it's very easy to, you know, uh, uh, create a very functional uh, apartment having the chance to enter from one side and then to have, uh, uh, you know, access to the other side of the building, a double orientation. I actually built such a building myself in a city in, the, in, in Romania. A much smaller than this one, of course. Now here we see concrete, exposed concrete, very heroically, and uh, I like it. I, I, I like concrete. At that time, people uh, didn't uh, care about uh, pollution or uh, things like this, you know, like uh, climate change and so on. But today, it's a different story. Today, we should abstain from using concrete as much as possible. But what I like here is that you see the structure, you see the the, the exposed concrete, very vigorous, you know, and the, the scale, I mean, it's very vigorous. But then within, framed by this heroic um, concrete structure, we have windows that remind one of um, Japanese traditional uh, architecture, to an extent even of his own house. And so it, it, I think it's a marvelous example of uniting an audacious modernity with a, a sensitivity that didn't neglect, didn't forget what, what we call the past 
brought us. A very unusual block of flats because it is, uh, yes, it, 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 it's clearly a mega social machine, but somehow you have the feeling that the individual units are, are uh, uh, also honored. So, no, you know, it's not a depersonalizing building. It's a personalized building where each unit, although he employs identical elements, but because of this subtle clan d'oeil towards the past, the building, uh, although, as I said, audaciously modern, is not, is not, is not divorced, is not totally divorced from the past. Very nice work. Now, another one from 1959, Setagaya Community Center in Tokyo. Here we see the heroism of, uh, you know, exposed concrete at its most uh, asserting. Uh, this, is, this is Japan uh, around that time. Many architects employed, you know, large surfaces of uh, exposed concrete. And uh, they did it with a, with a, with a pathos that was, uh, you know, was and is uh, impressive. Maybe that's why, I mean, they contributed to the, uh, you know, the reemergence of uh, brutalism with a publication called SOS Brutalismus and, uh, you know, exhibitions, publication in, in recent years. Unfortunately, as I said, concrete is uh, a very significant polluter of the world, and uh, we have to be very, very careful. Well, what is nice about the, the, the concrete, though, although Frank Lloyd Wright didn't like concrete and he called it a conglomerate, is that when, and actually I admire more this treatment or lack of treatment of the concrete, this exposed concrete, which is not polished, like in the case of Tadawand. I think concrete is uh, at its best when it shows even its imperfections, when it is raw. If it is polished, it's almost, uh, I don't know, uh, inappropriate. Maybe the word is not by the, the best that I, I found, but uh, well, this is my preference for a raw expression of concrete. And look at look at this handrail. I left it like this enlarged because um, bec I don't know. It moves me to see that this. Uh, this is an architecture without uh, finishes, you know, it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's not hiding, it's not hiding, you know, the wood is wood, concrete is concrete, and you see it, it's not, it, it, it's exposed, there, there is a level of sincerity that I, that I admire here. I wish uh, we'd have the courage to, to build it this way again. Not to be afraid of rawness. <clears throat> As Zaha Hadid said, she, her uh, <clears throat> desideratum was, <clears throat> uh, she declared, to, to build a, a, a raw, earthy, and uh, vital architecture. Maybe sometimes her uh, buildings, or maybe often her buildings have a level of vitality, but they are certainly not raw and they are not earthy. But here we do see earthiness, and in some other works, we also see earthiness. We, what I'm saying, we see rawness, and also in some other works, uh, earthiness. The Kyoto Kaikan in Kyoto, uh, I forgot what this means, actually, Kaikan. Uh, sorry about this. I thought my memory was better, but it's not. Anyway, this is in Kyoto. Maybe some kind of a conference hall, or uh, I don't know. Uh, Tokyo Bunka Kaikan again, Kaikan. Now, now I think this is an opera house. Uh, let's see, yeah, opera house, uh, but maybe with a hybrid function. This one in Tokyo from 1961. 
uh, is, a, is a famous one. But you can see pretty large. So I guess that's what it means, Kaikan, Bunka Kaikan, Tokyo Bunka Kaikan, 1961 in Tokyo. It's not overwhelming and it doesn't have a, you know, a, an oppressive verticality at all. It's rather horizontal. Although he built also something vertical and we are going to see later. It's also interesting what Toyo Ito said about Kunio Maekaba. And a little bit later on, we are going to read uh, what, he, what he had to say about uh, Kunio Maekaba. Well, uh, what, I, what actually he said was that uh, Kunio Maekaba was the first and the last Japanese architect who kind of avoided the Japanese essentialism. That's what Toyo Ito said. A good, another good building by, uh, by Kunio Maekaba in, in Tokyo. And I love the... I mean, I don't know, it's, it's almost uh, surprising, this tree you now in front of the, you know, an opera house in, 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 in a major city of the world, you know, Tokyo. And maybe the love for nature that the Japanese have, but also the way, you know, this tree is left there with all its uh, paradigmatic power and its... Uh, you know, beautiful primitivism, if I am to, you know, conclude that, uh, you know, the tree at, or a tree can be primitive. It's the power of nature. It's the power of nature, robust, you know. Uh, and, and, and then the building behind it is as it is. It's not, it's not overwhelming the, the tree. And, and that's an excellent thing. That's not the kind of architecture. We try to compare, for example, this building with the opera in Paris by Charles Garnier. You can't. There are two different sensibilities. I mean, I know that this is what the building is, but when I look at the pictures, I, I, I wouldn't imagine that this is, uh, you know, a, an opera house. It could be almost anything else, but not an opera house. And yet, look, the interior. Very interesting architect, Kunio uh, Maekawa. A little bit difficult and complex because of his complexity. He deserves more attention and more study. And I, 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 would, I would try for the next time when I pay homage to him to, to study him a little more. Hayashibara Museum of Art in Okayama, 1964. Here we see, you know, uh, the traditionally, no, I shouldn't say so, because he was not a traditionalist. But, but this kind of building, you wouldn't expect from an architect who worked for, with, with for and with Le Corbusier with a number, for a number of years and who promoted himself modernity in Japan. But, but this building is, uh, you know, is almost anonymously uh, traditional. You didn't expect, uh, you know, the, to be done by, a, uh, you know, a famous uh, modern uh, modern architect. This building. It it, it shows how complex uh, and versatile uh, Kunio Maekawa was. Hayashibara Museum of Art, Kunio Maekawa. 
Now the Saitama Cultural Center, 1966, someone wrote, uh, I found an article about this building, <clears throat> a sense of proportion, discretion, and durability, visiting Kunio Maekawa Saitama Prefectural Museum. So again, proportion, discretion, and durability. Uh, this is the website where I, I read about it and I took some pictures from. Um, that person wrote, Marco Capitanio, about him, about this, this work. Uh, this is uh, an issue of the Japan architect, the uh, celebrated uh, uh, architecture magazine uh, uh, dedicated to Kunio Maekawa and with a picture of this particular work. Now look at this, and 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 and, and uh, I I uh, I almost wish it was raining here. I mean, I, I I like this. Look at the pavement. Look at the water accumulated on the pavement. Look at the grass. Look at the bushes. Look at the trees. And I noticed that in his later works, he uh, brought nature in more and more, and he, he began to employ bricks like here, but it's, it's, it's beautiful. Now you also have the chromatics, that uh, the dialectics between, you know, reddishness or redness, you know, that the brick has, although it is nuanced here. And the green of the trees, of nature, of grass, of bushes, of tree, it beautiful. it's beautiful. I'm sure Alvarado would have loved it too. Uh, this is the model. So we see asymmetry here, but we saw his own house, which was perfectly symmetrical. A very fine museum. And the employment of the materials is exquisite, you know, using bricks outside of the walls, but also on the, on the horizontal surfaces. Very, very nice. Proportion, discretion, and durability. And here is the quotation from Toyo Ito that I mentioned. My Kaba was our first and last free, meaning ideologically independent architect, who till the end rejected returning to only Japanese essentialism. In other words, he, his uh, palette, uh, his repertoire was uh, larger and uh, beyond what Toyo Ito calls Japanese essentialism. Now we see another intriguing work, uh, this uh, very famous uh, world exhibition, World Expo in 1970 in Osaka, where the Metabolis, uh, uh, you know, had the very extravagant uh, buildings built, but he built a very modest building. And, you know, I understand why he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, not so much advertised as some other architects. Because this building in 1970 at a very spectacular world exhibition where architects like uh, Kenzo Tange and Kionori Kikutake and Arata Isozaki contributed significantly and uh, with eye-catching, uh, uh, you know, productions, um, Kunio Maekaba was rather modest and subdued. And you are going to see the building. This is the building. It's a building which, uh, you know, doesn't attract attention. In what way is the, because it's, dead, it's a steel pavilion. It's this reddish part here, uh, you know, that, that is, um, you know, almost a reference to, to Miss van der Rohe or to a certain kind of steel architecture that was uh, promoted and, and built uh, all over the world, or especially the United States. Is this part that stands out as uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, advertising for the function of the building that is the steel pavilion? Otherwise, the pavilion is, is almost not interesting. But the, 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 the duality of the building makes it interesting. I don't know what this is, and I don't know what, if he did it. It's probably just a, you know some kind of enclosure or some kind of an open uh, ceiling uh, 
meaning no ceiling pavilion made of steel. And here we see, we see steel indeed, but the building is not made of steel. And yes, the equipment inside the building is steel through and through, but the architecture is very almost common, most spectacular, interesting work. Uh, 1974 Tokyo Marine and Fire Insurance Building. This is a tall building. It's the only one that I found by him that was tall. 1974, uh, the Marine and Fire Insurance Building in, in, in Tokyo. But he uses brick here again. It's a fine building. It's a very fine building. Sorry about the, you know, uh, the authorship of this photograph, which bothers me. I don't know why people do this, you know, to destroy great pictures just because they want to, you know, make it so obvious that uh, someone, a certain someone was the author. The Japanese flag. The redness of the Japanese flag, the, the you know, perhaps a symbol of Amaterasu, the sun goddess, a primordial goddess in uh, in, in Japan, Amaterasu. And it's interesting that uh, you know, in uh, in Europe, the sun is a masculine deity, but in Japan, it's a feminine deity, and that is Amaterasu. And we see brick, the red brick, very nice work. Bravo, my Kaba. Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum. It's a, um, it's, 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 it's a, it's a work from 1975. Also, as you can see, in it, you know, later he, uh, in his later years, he uh, almost continuously employed bricks. Some people thought that this was um, a rather European uh, kind of uh, aesthetical statement, but I think his, his buildings are still uh, Japanese. And I like the fact that his architecture is not ostentatious. It's rather reticent. Yes, it's well executed. Yes, it is modern, but it's not ostentatious. Kunio Maekaba. Kumamoto Prefecture Museum of Art in Kumamoto, 1976. Now, this picture here. Uh, it's a little bit misleading because there are other pictures of this museum which are um, different. This one has a, a certain level of monumentality, but you see the, 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 the walls do have graphics, do have ornament. You know, uh, the surface is not just left, you know, the plain or blank. It's, it, it, has, it has a playful geometry on it, which is ornamental. And then the great trees of Japan are here also, and we are going to see, well, I, as I said, I had problem like this picture I couldn't find in a large resolution, and I would have liked to see it bigger, but I can't. Um, this one is in black and white. But again, I like the, 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 the use of the brick for the, for the um, you know, the, the horizontal surfaces. Uh, and now images of, of the building that is again in a in a in a in a harmonious dialogue with nature, with the green, and this is the plan of the of the museum. It's a perfect equilibrium between clay 
and uh, uh, plant material, if I am to call them so, you know, the trees and the bushes and so on. And you have the bricks and the bricks are clay. And then, you know, the color of that material and then the color of the foliage of the trees. And they are, they are, they are in, in, in good equilibrium. But they both belong to the earth because the bricks also belong to the earth. So he left behind that uh, concrete period and uh, became more nuanced, softer in a way. The Museum of East Asian Art, but in Köln, in Germany, Cologne, 1977, It's clear we are in Germany. We see here two Volkswagens, Beetle, a great car. But the museum, again, is not extravagant uh, as uh, we are accustomed these days to see very extravagant, sometimes even crazy buildings. Now, my cover had a sense of measure. Well, the artworks are uh, something else. Uh, he didn't create the artworks, but the building is reticent. Uh, an interesting courtyard. So we are in Germany, in Köln. A sand garden. The Museum of um, Asian um, uh, Art. Now Fukuoka Art Museum, 90, another art museum, 1979. Again, his buildings are not surprising, but if you if you dwell on them a little bit and meditate on them, they are probably rich sources of inspiration. And increasingly, I see the 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 harmonious relationship between building and nature. The National Museum of Western Art Annex in, in Tokyo, 1979. The National Museum of Western Art was built by Le Corbusier, but Kunio Maekaba built the annex. Uh, so, and I think he contributed also or assisted uh, Le Corbusier. I'm not sure about it, but since he worked together with Le Corbusier for a number of years, he probably was involved also in the uh, in the process of building the building by Le Corbusier, the museum, the National Museum of Western Art. This is the museum built by Le Corbusier. And Kunio Maekawa built next to it an annex for the same function, for the same building. So again, this is by Le Corbusier and this is by Kunio Maekawa. And I, I admire him for the fact that, you know, he was not intimidated by the work of, of, of Le Corbusier and he created an architecture that, that was his and in, in, in some good respects, very different from the architecture of, of Le Corbusier. We see again and again the value placed on the landscape, on the gardening, on nature. A concrete is used only sporadically, you know, like these parapets here, and this is, you know, is again, it's gone that uh, brutalismus of uh, uh, earlier years.
And the next two pictures are taken from a magazine. I mean, the, the last two pictures, this one and, and, and this one. And now we go to the Miyagi, Miyagi, Miyagi Museum of Art in Sendai in 1981. We are approaching the end of this presentation. We see again, you know, the immersion of, of the building into the landscape, the proximity of nature, the, 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 the affection for nature without having the building, uh, uh, you know, renounced completely to its, uh, its own characteristics. But this, this dialogue between nature and building is, uh, uh, I think, uh, distinctive in, in his later years. If you would have built this building, uh, let's say 30, 40 years later, this would, would probably, this would have been probably exposed concrete, raw concrete. Well, it's not like this any longer. This is from 1981. Brick again, beautifully, uh, you know, uh, uh, put to work. A museum is a museum. A, the interior is often uh, rather predictable because the interest is of the artworks that are displayed on the walls. But what is unusual here is that the walls are not white. And that's a good thing, I think. Kumamoto Prefectural Theater in Kumamoto, 1982. Again, it shows this work, the value he placed on the horizontal surfaces. They have an ornamental design. It doesn't uh, just uh, treat uh, the surfaces we, we walk on without aesthetical considerations. It's a, you know, an amphitheater inside the building and the section, I have another section if I'm not mistaken, uh, schematic as it is and low resolution. I try to explain what happens that some pictures uh, you know, coming from Japan are either very small resolution or very large. I, this one again is, I wish it was bigger. But anyway, you can, you can still have an idea about, you know, how he conceived this uh, large, you know, uh, auditorium inside the building. But this is surprising, even for buildings that have, a, you know, large volumes or large spaces, the feeling you have outside of the building is that there are, they are rather discrete buildings, you know, uh, one, two floors, uh, the trees are taller than the building. You even wonder where is this space actually, you know, it exists, but it's kind of hidden since such pictures can be taken from the building. I mean, how many buildings today in the world are lower in height than the height of the trees? Not many. And we are talking about, you know, Japan, a very, you know, developed country and very capable of building height. In the inside, he has this space, which is uh, uh, very interesting and, uh, you know, aesthetically, um, you know, enticing. But I need to study the building more to understand how come such a big volume is able to be hidden somehow. I mean, it's, 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 it's hidden in some parts of the building and by some parts of the building. And, 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 and many pictures are like this, as I said. You, you would say this, this is not the same building, but it is. That's it. So let's wish happy birthday to Kunio Maekawa and let's hope the next time I'll have the chance to talk about him. We'll learn more things about this remarkable Japanese architect. Thank you.